thank you to uh, the Institute for inviting me, and uh, thank you to Shane and June for kind words about our work and our joint work together. I think it's uh, it is of interest. It's just interesting, I think, like, it's really hard now. I think the idea is we need to be very careful that we include extensive shots or stresses as well as intensive shots when we talk about analysing risks. The other thing that's very interesting is diagram on, on the localised price market volatility in Malawi. We, we uh, did a cash transfer to look at a, a seasonal hunger gap there in 2005-2006, and it was evaluated by Stephen Deborah of the IDS. And uh, was was seen as a really uh, analytical response to the market because what we did was we looked at uh, what food was available in local markets and we balanced cash versus food to give out to who undermining local markets. It was quite interesting. I'll very quickly run through. I have quite a few slides here, but I'll quickly run through them. Uh, I think the main point really is I think there's a whole range of issues around resilience to food and nutrition security. You know, the whole global, global food systems, regional food systems, everything. I, mean, I think it's if we and people like that and are not who are more experts on those. The concern focus really is, is within developing countries and particularly going up from the household community to the national level. I won't go to our definition because it was very similar to the one that Raju pushed to put a while ago. And I think what I want to say is, I mean, I was at the at the Free 2020 Con, Division 2020 Conference in Addis in, in May. And it was a great conference. I think what was coming out of it for me, some of the big messages were the concept and de definition are largely agreed to now. And the bigger challenges really are the measurement and the operationalization of resilience, particularly to food prices. Um, I think there was a whole range of discussion around political economy analysis. Again, we keep back to what you're saying, Arnon, the importance of that. The problem is, I suppose, that the costly investments for long term change don't sit well with politicians making decisions for short runs and electoral cycles. So you have this problem about people investing in something that might not happen, and this is a, obviously a huge issue. Again, I think you know multi-sectoral collaborations. We all talked about it. Multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral approaches required to uh, create resilience, but it's a crowded space. I mean, I think we need to be smart and build on the critical ones. I think uh, Schengen focus on agricultural nutrition. There, you know, there's only so many behaviours we as individuals can change. I think that's the same for governmental departments. I think that's something we need to be careful about. Um, again, just going back, it's very interesting when reading some of the psychology uh, literature on resilience. I suppose this idea of the natural phenomenon of a stealing effect, that people who have faced adversity, something like 30% of them actually generally, naturally um, have positive adaptations. What's interesting is this idea about why they do it. We usually have one of the following, this idea of a perception of being effective or ability to use proxy efficacy, or a belief in collective uh, efficacy. So it's, again, helping individuals community to acquire alternative methods of coping, helping them to feel and be effective in situations of adversity. And I think that you know, links very much back to what Rajul was talking about in terms of building on social capital and what's there already, as well as building capacities in country. Uh, okay, we won't go, we won't go there. <laughs> um, I suppose the intent behind it, I think you probably all have it already. Um, Again, if we would be knowledgeable at this, because it was, it was the basis of our uh, part of the Global Hunger Index last year. We in Kenya, my, we worked in Moyala district at the very bottom there in, in Kenya for quite a number of years. We're still working there. And if you look at the difference between 2000 and 2011, when the, 2010 and 2011, when the, the, base of the, the, the major hunger happened in East, East Africa, you can see the area we were, where we were working. The global acute malnutrition, the sphere acute malnutrition rates didn't change very much. If they did, it was, it was in a positive direction. In our area where we were working, we kept things well below the sphere standards. In the other areas, things were spiking massively. They said, how did we do it? We actually invested in long-term asset building, and in uh, these are the lessons from it in some ways, is we invested in asset building, looking at uh, multi-sectoral approaches, getting people better water, better livelihoods, etc. So multi-sectoral interventions. We worked with existing institutions coordination so that they, they own them. Uh, we addressed some of the environmental drivers of risk, uh, you know, environmental degradation, for example. So you look at things like watershed management and all of that. Again, addressing gender issues, as mentioned earlier, I'll come back to it. But this idea of making sure that you've got early warning systems and early action. So when you see that there is a food crisis about to, uh, to happen, that you actually uh, respond to it very quickly through social protection or good uh, nutrition responses. So this idea of creating a contingency plan responding quickly are very important. Um, we, we did this program in Kenya. It was obviously very effective. The problem was we hadn't invested in the evidence. So what we did with Tufts University is we've now designed a program about two years ago in eastern Chad, um, funded by Irish Aid, 
and we call it community resilience to acute malnutrition. But we're investing in the evidence. So Tufts University have done the. Uh, it's basically a randomised control trial. They've done the baseline. They're going to do the end line. We're just doing the midline at the moment, actually. And you can see on the left there, it's basically that package to build community resilience. So it's the building the assets of communities through. Uh, just go on here. Yeah, through these things. So improved agricultural production. So again, conservation agriculture, better livelihoods that Arnon was talking about. You know, access to high quality health and nutrition services, access to wash, and again, increased participation of women, so changing gender norms. And again, if you look at each of these dimensions, they're exactly aligned with the UNICEF conceptual framework for undernutrition. That's exactly the point. The point, though, on their own is they've, we've got to do that long term work, but we, so we have to build capitals and assets, but we also have to be able to respond to uh, hunger crises as they happen. And, and, and we know now they're happening every two years as opposed to every 10. Oops, sorry, let's go back. Just something to throw into the mix here. We're working in a very remote part of Eastern Chad. Now, you know, Concern is a very grounded organisation. We're really interested in what happens on the, on the ground. Michael Woolcock from the World Bank and Harvard was speaking in Trinity about two weeks ago, I don't know if you many of you, about the lack of government implementation capacity in many countries. And it's quite interesting. He, he, he's identified... Two, two things that he feels are really, really problematic with government uh, implementation capacity. One is this idea that you know, the government can have, they have the functional forms and structures, but they actually don't have the functions. They're actually not functional in very remote parts of these countries. So you've got a health service that's not functioning, you've got, you've got various uh, ministries that really have, have very little functional and implementation capacity. And this idea of premature load bearing. So unrealistic expectations about what can happen from those. Feelings that they're undermining uh, indigenous learning, and again, this idea of local political economy. So, I mean, for us as, a, as an organization, I think it's that classic tension between global better practice. So, we know the systemic re reviews based on randomized controlled trials and big impact evaluations. We know that you always have to contextualize those, and it causes a problem. There's a classic dilemma for NGOs, I think, in finding mechanisms to scale up pilots. And you know, and I think this is the um, Schengen referred to the if we rain problem again. I've always said that my job and concern for the last fifteen years has been to try to get concern out of the middle of programs and push us on the edges to try and get governments or, or local actors as the ones driving it. But we find ourselves in these more remote areas having to start something off and then try to hand them over as much as we can to local institutions. So again, I think it's, it, it, it links very well with I think something that came out of Vision 2020 about needing to get people access to success stories and be able to scale them up. That's what we're actually doing with the RAIN program in Zambia. We're trying to show something worked, and Schengen referred to it, how it's being scaled up. In fact, the Zambian government is now applying this district nutrition coordination committee in 15 other districts, and that was the whole purpose of it, that it would get scaled up like that. Just to give you an idea, this is a delivery ward at Carroll Health Centre, where we're working in Eastern Chad. That's it, that's the delivery ward. And there's nothing in that cabinet. So it gives you a sense of, of what the health services we're talking about. One of the things that Concern is trying to do at the moment, this is a very crowded site, but the sense of it is this, that we, we identify thresholds where the local health services are completely overburdened. Uh, and then what we need to do is provide support at, depending on on how high that case load is. This can be applied to uh, cases of severe acute malnutrition, it can be applied to diarrhea, it can be applied to cholera or whatever. And it's very similar to like what we're trying to do with the Ebola now, where the local health systems have been overburdened, but how do we give them surge capacity when they need it, especially on a, a seasonal basis, and then it becomes scaled back. Um, just the last couple of things, just some I said the two biggest challenges are measurement and operationalization. There's obviously a, a, an international group focusing on the uh, measurement issue at the moment, this uh, technical working group. And, uh, you know, Mark Constas, John Hodnett from IFRI is involved in that, Dan Maxwell from uh, Rachel Scott from OECD. There's a whole range of very clever people involved in that. We're not going to work at that level. What we're doing, though, is we're, we're, we're developing this community resilience indexing system, and our DRR advisor is... He's actually working on that at the moment. Ironically, Goal, one of our colleagues here in Ireland, have developed their own, just similarly, just funded by ECHO. And actually, the Goal one is both based on the Hyogo Framework for Action. Ours is focused very much on the Sustainable Livelihoods approach, but very similar, both probably a little bit overly DRR-focused. I think, and one of the things we've done with our PRAM um, uh, programme is we have a very simple proxy of success, and it's basically about the hunger period and making sure that people are not severely acute malnourished for a, for a shorter period of time. I think it's actually a very good proxy. We realise that the clever intellectuals will have to do a huge amount of work on the resilience. At the moment, we're trying to be very uh, practical about it. 
Don Hunt, our DR advisor, has just come back from Chad, actually, and he's been doing some risk planning uh, funded by OFTA on this one. <coughs> so what's interesting is he's basically, there, there are no DRR structures the, below district level. So he's been working at community level. He's got this Comité Local d'Action, and he's been doing risk planning with them, but he's getting them then to self-assess what are their capacities like for resilience based on the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a really interesting tool. You can see even that before they had their community, you see the community resilience index score at the bottom. After they did the risk plan, they scored themselves higher. Not surprising. But what's good about it is that it's about building capacity. Just to say on that is we're having a bit of an argument internally about whether this is actually a really good capacity self-assessment tool for communities or whether actually it contributes to global knowledge about the measurement of resilience. And Chris Bain, for example, for IDS, has suggested to us how we might be able to use it as a, con as a contributor to this wider measure, but I think it's going to be probably too complex and we probably won't have the funding for it. Um, the last thing just to say, and it's just a, a kind of a, a pointer, we do focus very much on the UNICEF uh, conceptual framework, and we talk about the, the, key, the key issues around uh, food nutrition um, security. Concern now is working in extremely insecure environments. We're talking about the Chads, the Nigers, the Sudans, uh, we're talking about DRC. And I think one of the things, if we really want to be expert in community resilience building in these kinds of contexts, we're going to have to build expertise, I think, both in governance, but also in what I would call conflict risk reduction. Because conflict, there's a, there's a, there's a relationship between conflict also and food and nutrition security. And it's very interesting. We had a really interesting um, presentation from Clean O'Reilly Rally from University of Sussex, who used to be in Trinity here last year, on this armed conflict location and event data. And it's a phenomenal data set. But what's interesting about it is now she's beginning to do a lot of analysis linking things like rainfall and uh, seasonal rainfall with uh, incidents of, of uh, conflict. And again, we're interested in looking at that. How, do people, how are people resilient to conflict? Because it's something that we're, we're always uh, uh, dealing with. I think that's pretty much it. So well, I don't think I have a conclusion. Thank you very much.